Good morning and welcome. Just want to welcome everybody this morning. Hopefully you got your cup of coffee and ready to join us. Thank you for joining us today for our presentation on U.S. expansion, scaling your U.S. operations. I'm Carolyn Powell, Business Development Director at Tronconi Segura and Associates, and I will be your host today. Before we begin, I will point out the menu bar that should be to the top right of your screen. You can click here to manage your audio options, ask a question, or download the PDF copy of today's slide in the handout section. And if you wanna follow along or take notes. Feel free to type any questions you have into the question box and the sidebar during the presentation and we will get them answered at the end. We will also provide everyone's full contact information at the end of the presentation if you'd like to follow up with them directly. Later today, we will send you a copy of the presentation and a link to the recorded version if you'd like to view it again or share it with a colleague. Before we get the presentation started, I'm honored to introduce and welcome Acting Council General Hawar Naysom from the Canadian Consulate in New York to our webinar. The Acting Council General and his team are a great resource for Canadian companies as they look to sell into the US and expand with a physical presence on this side of the border. Hawar and his team are based here in New York State and previously Hawar was Canada's Council General in Minneapolis, so he knows the US market very well and I will now hand it over to him to welcome you to our 2021 kickoff cross-border webinar. Omar? Well, thanks so much for that, Carolyn. Uh, and, and thank you for, for doing this. Thank you for, for hosting today's event um, and, and for the work that, that you all do to support Canadian businesses. I, I really wish I could be with all of you in, in Buffalo. Uh, my, my visits to, to Buffalo are always so memorable and I will share with with you that, that personally I was rooting for uh, the Buffalo Bills this past Sunday and, and really hoping for a Buffalo Bills uh, Green Bay Super Bowl matchup for perhaps it's because I'm Canadian and I like cold weather teams but um, you know the Bills have got a great future and, and I'm a huge Josh Allen fan uh, and won't it be nice when Canadians like me can 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 get back to flocking to Bill Stadium um, you know, I want to start. I want to start first, first and foremost, with with the most pressing issue, which is our border. And 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 suggest to you that yes, it's closed to non-essential traffic, but yet still, nearly 90% of the commercial volumes continue. And and you know, on a human side, critical persons like Canadian healthcare workers who cross every day from Canada into the U.S. to work in hospitals in in Buffalo and in in upstate New York are still doing so. We're, we're going to get through this. We're going to get through this together. The border will reopen, and we will need to continue our push to promote the greatest friendship in the world, the cross-border relationship, which is so well articulated and defined in places like upstate New York and specifically in Buffalo. I'm pleased to be a part of today's session with Tronconi Segara and, and Associates and also our, our CARA leading talent management company based in Buffalo. And I might add, they've got three offices in Canada. Today's event is precisely what we need, a forward-looking plan for how it's gonna go once we get through this. Now, as, as Carolyn mentioned, I, I started my career in the Foreign Service as a trade commissioner, helping Canadian companies do business in foreign markets. So I, I fully understand the value of, of hearing from practitioners on expert advice they can give. And I want to reinforce that preparation is key. An added bonus for Canadian companies is that the border proximity allows you to put your toe in the water and, un, and, and get a sense in a place that's familiar. Crossing the border in, into Buffalo or into upstate New York just makes sense for Canadian companies. Now, uh, Carolyn referenced that we're based in Manhattan, but for those of you who wonder what a consulate general does, well, well so do I on some day. <laughs> you know, I swear, I swear these jokes are much better in person. I hope that they're that they're 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 landing, but I'll I'll never know, I guess, since I'm speaking into a computer screen. You know, we're about a hundred people. We're located in Manhattan. We offer a full range of services from visas to technology centers to accelerators to promoting Canadian artists and of course 
promoting free trade. We have offices in, in Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, and most importantly, we have an office in upstate New York, specifically staffed by uh, our trade commissioner, Linda Soltis, who is, first of all, fabulous, and, and perhaps one of the most learned colleagues we, we, we have in our network. She's a great resource and contact for US and Canadian companies interested. So if you haven't met with or reached out to Linda, please do so. Um, the other thing I want to underline is that the concept of trade or, or trade commissioners is often seen as people who, you know, promote trade or uh, from Canada into the U.S. or promote U.S. companies investing into um, into Canada and closing their eyes to the other stuff. That's not at all w w what we're about. We fully support Canadian companies who want to invest in the U.S. And of course, we love it when U.S. companies, such as our CARA presenting today, expand into Canada. We see it, uh, trade as a two-way street and that trade follows investment. For Canadian companies to succeed, they need to expand their footprint. They need to be global. So, you know, I applaud the activity today and I want to say that we are here to support Canadian companies as well as U.S. companies on their investment journey. The truly great thing about our Canon relationship is that you is that normally under normal circumstances you can go back and forth uh, for business, but also for pleasure. The other thing I want to talk about is, is of course, uh, NAFTA, Kuzma, USMCA. Um, you know that was like a, a, a two and a half year project which which fully consumed us. I spent a whole heck of a lot of time talking with great people uh, in uh, in the U.S. about the importance of our relationship, and what what came out of that uh, was the most advanced, progressive, gold standard of uh, a trade agreement. Most importantly for, for for companies on both sides of the border is it provides predictability, stability. 99% of goods are tariff free. There are there are rules around um, dispute settlement, all sorts of rules on chapters, on on labor enforcement, on environment, and it is the gold standard. And 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 uh, we're very pleased with it. I'd be remiss if I didn't state. Uh, my concern about what was announced yesterday uh, by the president uh, about Buy America sentiment. You know, it runs counter to Canada and the U.S. And, you know, what I often hear when I talk to U.S. companies is, or U.S. officials is, oh, that's not, that's not meant for you. There are other bad actors. It's not, it's not Canada. We don't, we don't mean Canada. But the, the challenge is, is that we are your number one trading partner. We are New York State's number one trading partner. Your trade with Canada dwarfs the trade that, that the U.S. does with any other jurisdiction. In fact, if you added the, the next two or three partners together, you'd get to where Canada is. So the integrated supply chains are adversely affected by measures like Buy America. We've advocated for a long time that there should be a carve out because we go back and forth across our border and those sorts of protectionist measures impact Canadian and U.S. companies. So it's something we're, work, we're, we're watching closely and we're working on. I was testifying yesterday at the New Jersey uh, Assembly uh, and, and we'll continue to do that. Listen, uh, I, I want to get on to some of the more interesting speakers today. So, you know, my ask of all of you is, is once it's safe, please resume pre-COVID back and forth patterns. We never want to see that diminish and it's a concern that I have. If you or any of the people on the audience have ideas on how we can reinvigorate that relationship, how we can really put it to the forefront once we open the border, hey, let us know. Reach out to me, reach out to my, my team, reach out to, to Linda in Buffalo, uh, and, and we want to hear from you. Now, I could, I could go on, but, but I, I know nobody, nobody wants that. So let me turn it back to Carolyn Powell to introduce the experts. Thank you for this opportunity to discuss the relationship and say how much I look forward to a time when we can uh, meet together face to face and uh, cross the world's friendliest border and meet uh, meet up again. Keep safe. We're going to get through this together. Thanks and have a great session. Thank you, Hawar. I appreciate your time and all the work your team does to assist the Canadian companies grow in the U.S., but also the work that you do on you know making that border you know, as free flowing as it is and, you know, how, how
until we really do work together to grow both economies. So thank you again for joining us. For today's thank presentation, you. we have a great team, great team of experts that'll give you some insights and things to consider when expanding your business into the U.S. I'm joined by David Lever and Dan Spada, both principals at Tronconi Segui and Associates. David is one of our cross-border experts and assists many Canadian-based companies that are doing business in the U.S. Dan heads up our single source division that provides outsource accounting services to companies of all sizes. Franconi Segura and Associates' mission is to provide the best and most appropriate professional accounting, auditing, and tax consulting services in the industry. We work with many international-based companies, many of them being Ontario and Quebec-based, as they expand into the U.S. I'm also joined by Pete Petrilla, Managing Director at Acara Solutions. Acara Solutions, a member of Elrond Group is a leading provider of talent and recruiting solutions. The company has been headquartered in Buffalo for over 60 years and has offices in Canada, providing a variety of contingent labor, direct placement, and payroll services to clients throughout the U.S. and Canada. We will start our presentation and discussion with David Lever, who will give us an overview of things to consider when expanding into the US. Understanding your goals and operational needs will determine the best options and course of action for your business. We will cover the high level points, giving you what you really need to know to get started. Again, we'll leave time at the end for Q&A, so just put your questions in there. So without further ado, I will turn the presentation over to David to get us started. Thank you, Carolyn, and thank you, Kalara, for your insights this morning. So we're going to talk uh, a little bit about um, various aspects of, of expanding your business into the U.S. Um, and the first of those is, is determining the structure. Uh, it, and there's really three ways that we can go about um, expanding to the U.S. The first being the creation of a U.S. subsidiary, um, connecting business in the U.S. through your existing operating entity, what we call the U.S. branch, or acquiring an existing U.S. business um, in the transaction. We're going to focus on the first two bullets there this morning. And you know what's really important here is, is talking about the reasons and getting you, your company into the right structure um, right off the bat for your, for your business. A lot of times, companies need a U.S. operating entity, um, whether it be kind of that by, by U.S. that Kalar was referring to or made in the USA, um, or whether you're dealing with the U.S. government or um, jurisdiction that requires you to have a U.S. operating entity. It could be a regulatory or banking need, or, or, or if you just need that physical presence, um, depending on what your business may be. And in operating as the U.S. branch, there's other ways. The U.S. branch sometimes shields the foreign company um, from having to, to, to fully invest in the U.S. Um, the U.S. operating entity would shield the foreign corporation from U.S. taxes. But in some cases, businesses really just want to dip their toe into the U.S. They may not be entirely sure that their product, their service is going to take off in the U.S., so they just kind of want to try to test it out. And that's a lot, that's one of the situations that we um, usually use a branch to start conducting business in the U.S. And then from there, they may decide further down the road to create their own U.S. subsidiary. And really here, it's, a, it's really important that we get all, all of the professionals involved in this discussion, both legal and tax, on both sides of the border, because we really want to make sure that the plan that we're setting up for penetration into the U.S. market makes sense on both sides of the border. And, and when we're doing that, we usually try to maintain some type of flexibility, but then of course, we're looking at the goals for your business um, in, in the short term and po possibly the long term as well. In addition to just operating your business, you know, what your, what your plan is for succession or uh, exit from the business as well as all those factors need to be considered. One of the, the next couple of slides we're gonna talk about um, just some of the variables that we have to consider when we're trying to figure out this, this plan for you. And really what makes this interesting uh, in dealing with uh, in, in this area 
for me personally is, is just just the various businesses there's really not there isn't a one-size-fits-all approach i mean we really have to create a kind of a customized plan depending on your facts and circumstances uh, about your business and how you're going to conduct it um, so this is where we talk about kind of the who what when where why how um, and in talking about that with regards to a service-based business you know where the work's going to be performed is important you know is it going to be remote um, or you know on site and that's going to Going to have some implications that we'll talk about with regards to uh, your tax obligations. Now, who's going to be doing that work? Um, if you're using company personnel, of course, we have payroll, payroll type considerations, um, but even the use of a third party contractor um, you know, could, could trigger some uh, tax obligations for you in the US. Um, and this could, could also potentially be more complicated um, as the US does have some uh, gray rules with regards to who is an employee as opposed to a uh, independent contractor. So usually that has to be kind of sorted out as well. Um, you know, how is the sales rate being generated? Um, you know, if you're using digital marketing, you know, which is more common these days as well, um, that usually doesn't cause as, as, as many issues for you in the US. But if you're sending salespeople down, um, because that's the way that, you know, your business generates sales, um, there are some more considerations that we'll, we'll talk about there as well. And then what is being sold and how is the income being derived? Um, in terms of uh, the digital world, um, if we're selling a subscription or software as a service, there can be some sales tax implications that we need to talk about as well. Um, and then it, with regards to when, the, when you're recognizing the revenue and the length of the contracts, so we could have some um, deferred revenue considerations or some accounting for a completed contract, but also We'll talk about how the length of a project, um, if it's long term, can have some impact on whether you're considered to be doing business in the US. And of course, the why, I mean, we, we always really want to get the whole uh, the picture in place. Um, you know, we need to figure out what your business is trying to accomplish. And if there's you know, one or two of these facts or workflows that we can change or alter that may change your tax, um, your tax picture, it, it may be in your best interest to do it. Usually we're, you know, we're always talking about this concept of, well, you know, don't let the tax tail wag the business dog. So if you've got a good opportunity here in the U.S., you know, we can help you, we can assist you, and advise you with what you need to know about the business or the, the tax aspect of your business. Um, but if you have a good opportunity, take it, um, and we can help you uh, accomplish what you're you're looking um, what you're looking to accomplish here in the U.S. And from a similar aspect when selling goods, you know, there's there's also additional considerations about where the title might be passing, um, is that may um, uh, impact whether you have a permanent establishment in the US, which we'll talk about on the next couple of slides. And where is the inventory located, is that could have a state and local impact as well to it. And then you know, are there other services related to, to the work, whether it's installation, repairs, or training, uh, as these could have uh, could have significant impacts as well on the state aspect and also the, the federal aspect too, about you know who is performing and who is performing the work as well and how it's being built. So these are all again details that we kind of have to get familiar with um, and and down so we can come up with an appropriate plan. Uh, again, how is the sale generated? Um, sometimes the use of um, digital marketing and Nexus, uh, click through Nexus, which we might talk about, and you know, using affiliates as well um, can have some implications. And then again, what is being sold? Um, in addition to the normal considerations, um, if you're transferring any IP or you have some rents and royalties, um, even amongst just your operating company to the US, those are things that we need to, to hash out as well. Um, transfer pricing is, a, is an area that you'll hear commonly talked about. Um, and really what that is, is just the, we have transactions between related entities. You have to satisfy both sides of the border and use an arm's length uh, transaction uh, model to determine um, the pricing on, on those things. But tra transfer pricing sometimes can be complicated, but it also presents an opportunity for us to plan um, about the, 
the flow of, of dollars back and forth across the border on both sides. And then moving on to some of the more detailed tax implications. So we're talking about whether your company is doing business in the US and oftentimes what happens is we have discussions with established um, foreign businesses and they're looking to penetrate the US market and we have the discussion and it turns out that they've already been doing business in the US and uh, either just haven't realized it or, or um, you know, weren't aware of that. Uh, we'll talk about from a federal standpoint, permanent establishment. And then on the state side, the concept is called nexus. And you know, dealing with the states is, is a little bit different here, especially than dealing with Canada because our states are sovereign and are able to, to, to tax um, businesses that are doing business in their state. So we often say it's, it's like dealing with 51 different countries between the federal government and the states. Um, and we really don't have that, that harmonized tax treatment that you're associated with in Canada with regards to um, federal and provincial, um, either on the, on the income tax side and also on the uh, state and local tax side that we'll, we'll get into in a moment as well. So on, uh, in discussing, discussing permanent establishment, um, you know, this is a concept that's a fixed place of business um, or if you have income producing assets in the US, under our statutory laws, you may, by having that presence, be considered to be doing business in the US. And that, then we'll, what we'll do is then look at the US-Canada Income Tax Treaty, which is the treaty between both countries that is meant to um, reduce or eliminate double taxation and also um, kind of make it easier for companies on both sides of the border to do business in the, the other country. And so depending on the situation, you know, we'll have to look at the treaty to see if, if there is some relief for you or if you'd really be considered to be doing business uh, and, and not be able to find that relief under the treaty. So for instance, in, in the case if you had a company that just had inventory in the US um, under the treaty, you would not be considered to be doing business in the US um, and have a permanent establishment, which would mean that you would not be taxable on the, the profits associated with those sales. Um, we, we probably recommend that you file something in the US to claim those benefits, but you would not be taxed on your, on your profits. Uh, salespeople uh, can be a, a bit trickier. You're sending folks down here and they're concluding contracts on behalf of your business. They, then you could be considered to be having that permanent establishment and those sales be subject to US um, federal income tax. The service permanent establishment is, is a little bit unique to the US-Canada Treaty, um, but there, there is a carve out for this. And, and this is in, in more of the case of, again, you're rendering services. And, um, and what it says is that if you spend 183 days or more in a 12 month period, or 50% of your gross business revenues, I'm sorry, and 50% of your gross business, business revenues, or if you've got 183 days for the same or connected projects for a US customer um, that has the US permanent establishment, then you're considered to be doing business in the US. And that 183 days is in any 20, 12 month period. So it could be, doesn't have to necessarily be within a calendar year or a business fiscal year. And one thing to note there too, the number of days is really the number of days that the business is sending employees into the uh, into the US to, to render services. So if you had 10 workers coming over here on the same day, that would be one day. Whereas if you had 10 workers coming out each on their own on different days, that would be 10 days for the business. And then there's, there's a further carve out if we're construction related, um, jobs as well that we've utilized in the past. So if you've got a, a building site or a construction site um, or installation, from the time that you are first on site until the time that the project is concluded or your contract has concluded, if more than 12 months has passed from that time, then you are considered to be doing um, to, to be doing business. So that, that sometimes is uh, one way that um, we, we, can, we can kind of avoid the, the PE issue. But in some cases, if, if, if you're working intermittently, um, it can come back to, to bite you as well. Um, and then in the area of kind of delivery and freight, some businesses, depending on their business, may deliver in their own trucks, or in the case of a, a, a freight company, they may be delivering into the US, 
Um, if you're only delivering, oftentimes you can avoid the PE, but if you're backhauling, um, you may create a PE. So we have to look at those, those situations and, and what you're doing very carefully. Um, and then there is also a state impact too, because as we'll talk about in a moment, the states really don't um, honor the US Canada tax treaty, income tax treaty. So then when we, when we turn to the state, we're talking about the concept of nexus and no, it's not the same nexus that you would pass, like you're considering going across the border, so there's no immigration uh, tr travel concept to it, but this, the concept of nexus is really the, um, the concept of doing business in a state. Um, and so for income tax purposes, the, the bar to cross is, is higher than for sales tax, but you need, for income tax purposes, you do need a physical presence. So if you have property in the state, so that could be inventory, um, or for some reason, if you're renting, of course, a, a piece of equipment or something like that to a, to a lessee that could, that could qualify, or if you have a fixed place of business or an office. Um, and then there is a, a special rule uh, for if you're just sending sales reps into the US, um, under our federal inter, kind of interstate laws, public law 86-272 is a, is a law that allows one company to send salespeople uh, from one state to another. And there are certain, there are certain things they can do and they can't do in terms of uh, sales generation, uh, but it does protect the company from income tax in that state. In some cases though, um, states have decided not to afford those protections to foreign corporations that are doing business in the US. Um, so again, that may be a consideration depending on what, what your company is doing as to whether you decide to have a US subsidiary. And to note there as well, you know, there are, there are many cases for our clients where the client does not have a permanent establishment um, for federal purposes based on what they're doing, but they, you know, they could, in the case of inventory and some of these other items, have nexus for state, for state income tax purposes and, and sales tax. So in that case, they, of course, they would not pay any federal income tax. They may be liable for state income tax on their sales. And then from a sales tax standpoint, the bar is much lower to clear um, to be have nexus and, and, and to be required to collect sales and use tax. Um, the physical presence there is, is again, uh, the rule um, is the initial rule. And then we've more recently come upon, upon this uh, concept of economic nexus, which was brought on by the Wayfair ruling um, in our Supreme Court a couple of years ago, whereby now you don't necessarily, well, if, if you have a physical presence, you're automatically there for sales tax purposes. If you have, but if you have now, you have a level of, of sales or number of sales in the state, and of course, each state has their own rules, then the, um, the company may be liable to collect sales tax on those transactions. And of course, we'd have to figure out if your, tra if your transactions are taxable in the first place. Um, and that's going to be gone into in a little bit more detail an upcoming webinar by our state and local tax team on February 11th. And then some other business considerations as well, um, not, not to go under the radar here. Um, payroll compliance. Um, in the US, again, with the state and local aspects of it as well, in terms of getting the right withholdings and regulations and, and having all those things, you know, um, we often recommend for most a lot of these items here that you you use a third party and don't try to do it in-house um, just because there's high exposure with these items and they're very uh, detailed and compliance oriented. Um, and there's just a lot of companies out there and you're gonna speak with one least one today that may do some of these things as well. And it just does not make sense for you to try to, to, to do those things and, and often it's better just to kind of focus on your business and uh, we can handle some of these, have these things handled at um, a more efficient and lower cost for you as well. So in addition to you know human resources and benefits, um, again, you, a lot of different rules here in the US with regards to those things than, than what you're dealing with in Canada and workers comp and unemployment insurance. These are mostly uh, administered at the state and local level, um, but these are the kind of protections and, and the requirements of, that your business will have if you're sending employees into the US 
um, to, to get that insurance for workers' compensation and also to um, be covered under for unemployment purposes uh, as well. And just to touch here as well on uh, employee considerations uh, dealing with the, the U.S. as well, um, Article 15 of the U.S. Canada Income Tax Treaty deals with income from employment. Um, so if you're sending employees down here, sometimes on a temporary basis, maybe as you're setting up operations, um, then you know if they're if they're earning less than ten thousand dollars while they're in the U.S., um, that that would not be taxable under the U.S. Canada Treaty. Uh, but if you're over ten thousand dollars, then you have to look a lot closer at as um, at, at their physical presence here as well. So it's it's again different from what the business may have in terms of this 183 day test in 12 month period because um, all days count um, for the employee. So if they're here for work days, that's great, but they're staying here or coming back for vacations. Um, we look at the 183 days um, for all business and personal days. Um, and so, you know, if, if, if we have to look really closely at the business and about whether they have a PE because it is inherently tied to the employee status. Because part of this exemption of the treaty would be is if they're sending employees down here for 183 days and the entity does not have a US PE or it's not being borne by a US PE. So in a case where we have um, employees that are coming down and you maybe have set up your US business and you have a US operating entity, one of the things we usually recommend, you know, it's may, may make your employees um, tax situation a little more difficult uh, in terms of compliance, but we really recommend that you kind of split your payroll or have that person on the U.S. payroll and that'll kind of mitigate some of these issues that we may have with you either sending your employees down to the U.S. and having your Canadian company doing business in the U.S. Um, and just getting them on that U.S. payroll uh, will kind of Create as a buffer between um, the U.S. and Canada. So you know, trying to keep your Canadian business just dealing with Canada and your U.S. business dealing with the U.S. And then I'm, on a more personal level for employees, you know, we do have a substantial presence test as well. And this is 183 day um, is is the most popular um, in terms of. So if you've got a if you've got a person down here for 183 days or more in in one year. Um, and that's for any part of a day, as it is counts as a day, um, then they're considered to be a U.S. person for tax purposes. And what that means is that they are subject to U.S. income tax on their worldwide income. Whereas if they're just coming down to work, and we consider them to be a non-resident, they would the scope of what they could be taxed on in the U.S. is just narrowed to the income that they're earning from um, that U.S. presence. There's also an alternate three-year way to test um, where you take the current year's days at full value, last year's days at one third, and two years ago at one sixth. And if you do the math and all that, um, and it's over 183 days, then you're also considered to be um, a U.S. person for tax purposes. And here's where we look to the to the tree for some relief. Um, under the residence article of the tax treaty, um, if you know if you're coming down here for work and you're your center, of, what they call center of vital interests and long-term uh, interests um, are all in Canada. And again, this is more of a kind of a qualitative analysis. Then, then we can file under the treaty to have you treated as a Canadian resident, still not a U.S. person, um, and file as a U.S. non-resident. But again, we're likely to have to file something uh, for that person to claim those benefits. And in some situations, they may still be on the hook for filing um, foreign bank account reporting as well. And then moving on um, to the state, to the state. Again, the states generally are not required to follow the U.S. Canada Income Tax Treaty. There are certain states that do, um, but in terms of even just going from state to state, most states don't have minimum rules um, with regards to sending an employee into your state and whether they they'd be liable for income taxes. And so we usually have to do some analysis and figure out whether um, kind of what the de minimis rules might be in that state. Some states do have um, some exemptions um, for those that are 
doing business in neighboring states. But for the most part, um, it, it really comes down to kind of a business decision. And this is, you know, applies to just not only foreign owned businesses, but also US businesses as well, um, in terms of uh, business decisions as, as to what makes sense in terms of evaluating your exposure in some of those states. Um, but of course, for the, at the employee level, if the, the business decides, yes, we're gonna file in the state, if we're gonna withhold uh, income tax as well, of course, the employee is gonna have to file along with that. Um, so, you know, this is kind of one area specifically where some detail, uh, detail analysis may be required, but also um, there's gonna be some practical, business practicality to it. Um, you know, of course, and our job is to, to lay those, those rules out for you and those exposures, and then from there, um, you might need to make a business decision one way or another. For example, if you're sending an employee into a, a state to do some installation work, and this might be the only customer you have in that state, you may, you may decide to live with that exposure. But again, um, that's gonna be something that uh, has to be decided by the business and ultimately the employee as well. Thank you, David. That was very insightful and a lot to think about there. Um, we're now going to turn things over to Peter to talk about, you know, the, the HR side of things and talent and some things to consider in that arena. Thank you, Carolyn. I uh, just want to say thank you for everyone for attending today uh, in advance and uh, thank you to Kuar and Linda for the remarks and for joining us today and the, the team here at Trinconi Cigar and Associates for inviting me and uh, building a partnership together in, in what we do. Um, I'm going to talk today about the value of outsourcing some of your business processes when you know you're considering your expansion into the U.S. if you are considering it uh, and you know the value of that and, and regardless of who you use uh, the value of outsourcing some of these practices as David kind of briefly mentioned uh, it gives you some opportunity to focus on your business and not have to focus on some of these details uh, and allow people who do that for a living to be able to do that. Um, the company that I represent is uh, the overall company is called Aleron. So Aleron, uh, as mentioned earlier, has been in business since 1957. Uh, it used to do business under Superior Group and we rebranded about three years ago. Uh, the firm that I'm representing today is Acara Solutions, but we have five different firms that are under the Aleron umbrella. Um, and really, if I was to summarize and use uh, a word that David threw around, and I'm going to use a different iteration of it, we're really a nexus of people and technology to help business outcomes and help create better business outcomes. Um, we are a group of companies focused around people and technology mostly, and then business process outsourcing. Um, in terms of people and technology and, and how to do that better. So for us, um, you know, in the end, it's really all about people. And it comes down to the right people, the right place, the right time. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, we're on the next slide here. Um, right people, right place, right time. You know, we want to make sure the right people are in the right seats at the right place at the right time to help businesses move forward. Um, we understand that, you know, it's productivity that matters, you know, not necessarily time commitments. So we want um, people to be productive working for companies that we work with. And, you know, we handpick these skilled professionals. We know their strengths. We know their weaknesses. Um, and firms like ours, you know, I don't want to just say us, but firms like ours do know strengths and weaknesses when it comes to the people that, uh, we would place with your business, so it's um, it creates a lot of uh, a lot of efficiencies. It creates a lot of synergies for you, uh, and then we can sit in the middle and be able to kind of bridge that connection for you with the people that are going to make the difference in your business. So, in specifics to staffing and uh, hiring, you know, I want to go through some of the advantage of, of advantages of outsourcing that when you come down, especially if you're expanding into the U.S. or even doing business in Canada, just some of the advantages of outsourcing in general. Um, you know, we recruit. Uh, that's one of the things that that firms like ours do. We go after people that are probably working and probably doing a job that you need done. Uh, at a very high level. And typically those people are not uh, necessarily looking for their next opportunity. They might be heads down on the work that they're doing, but when they get a call from someone like us, 
Um, they typically tend to take our call and want to understand what exists. So we go after very high quality, high quality candidates and very highly qualified candidates. You're going to be able to do that in a faster time frame. We have a network, a vast network, and companies like ours have a vast network of people who are ready, willing, and, and able for new challenges and for doing the work that you need done. Um, when it comes to costs, you know, there's a great cost of hiring, training, onboarding, things that you're gonna have to do and, and go through and be able to, to bring on the right person and get them adapted to the company and the, the job that you need. So to go through an entire hiring process uh, and be able to bring those people in uh, and then onboard them and train them, there's a lot of cost and a lot of time and effort that goes into that. So we take a lot of that burden off uh, usually in a more cost-effective way than if you were to do it on your own. And when you think of cost, also think of the productivity time that you yourself has or someone on your staff may have in terms of that uh, cost that goes into it. So if you lose productivity, um, that is a cost you know, against your business. So that's something to consider when you're looking at uh, an outsourced solution for, for hiring. Flexibility is a, a, an interesting thing, you know, this day and age, because one of the advantages, again, of outsourcing is you're able to be flexible. And some of the options um, that I'm going to review today are, are in relation to contingent staffing. So our, our definition of contingent staffing comes down to um, bringing people in, you know, at the times you need them and being able to move them out at the times you don't in a very efficient um, you know, not confrontational way so that it's very upfront, it's very direct. Um, you put them on a contract, they're working for three months. After three months, you may be able to really bring them on full time because they're really good at what they do. Maybe they're not really good at what they do and you, you didn't understand that during an interview process and you want to just let them go after three months. That contract's already established, they're already contingent. And this allows you also, and, and what we learned last year is companies need to be able to pivot Companies need to be able to, to scale up and down. This really allows you to do that. Bring people in for projects, be able to work at certain time frames, and then when they're done, they're done, or you can continue that if you choose to. So I mentioned contingent workforce, you know, and this is here's some bullets, you know, in terms of what that contingent workforce is. It really comes down to flexible. They're not actually employed by your organization. They're employed by our organization or a firm like ours. So we go through all of the risk. We take care of all the tax implications that David was talking about earlier. Um, we, we are taking on their workers' compensation. We're taking on their insurances. Uh, it really comes down to us. So all of that burden is taken off of you as an employer. They're our employee, but they work for you. Um, there's a predetermined contract, so this gives you an end date. You know, no, not a lot of um, obviously, employee agreements have end dates, so this gives you an actual temporary end date uh, for that person or group of people. And then, you know, they're, they really are focused on short-term needs. So if you do have a, something that's a short-term need and you want to scale up quickly, that's something that a contingent workforce can help you do and an outsourced firm like ours can help you do that. And eventually, if you want to bring them in full-time, as I mentioned, you're able to do that. So it's not a... Usually firms like ours will not charge a, a fee beyond a certain time frame. So if you work for 90 days, 120 days, that person works and are under contract and then you want to convert them to a full-time employee, you're usually done at no additional charge. In terms of 2021, well, labor outlooks, uh, if we were having this last year at this time, um, the labor outlook for 2020 would have looked a lot different than it's uh, the that it turned out to be. So. Um, interesting times, obviously, uh, from the time, I guess, you know, right now we're almost into February. At February of last year, the labor market was uh, completely different than it turned out to be in March and April of last year. So I can't predict the future. I don't think anybody can at this point. But I think what last year taught us is, is again, the needs to be flexible, uh, pivot when necessary, you know, and find ways to save costs. Uh, I think it, more and more companies, and, and it's been stated that more and more companies are going to use contingent workforces as they move forward because it does give them that flexibility. It does give them that ability to pivot or to, to kind of cut if they need to cut on a very quick basis. So that's going to, it's not it's something that's going to grow. Um, we hear a lot about gig economy and people doing different jobs. 
um, as their quote unquote day job. Uh, I think that is going to grow as well. So you're going to see less of the FTE full-time executive employees that are, are working for organizations and more of these contingent type of roles where business services, you know, marketing, sales, um, software development, things that are becoming more and more important will be done on a, a more um, part-time or fractional basis. So with ACARA, I mentioned contingent staffing. We do a lot of different things. We do contingent staffing. We do what we call payrolling, which is what I mentioned for us being the employer of record. Um, we do direct placements. We do temperature direct, which I mentioned earlier. We also do executive search. So when you're looking for executives, we have that as well. Um, our geographical presence, we're, as mentioned earlier, we have three offices in Canada. Um, are also our, one of our larger uh, geographies is in India. So we do a lot of our, our talent sourcing out of India. And then you can see on the map, we have a variety of locations throughout the US. So uh, we're able to pull talent from a lot of different places and locations. One thing I wanted to note uh, when it comes to uh, outsourced firms and, and being able to hire, especially in the US and in Canada as well, um, and what employer branding is. You know, a lot of companies focus on their customer and customer branding and marketing in relation to customer acquisition. A lot of companies don't focus on doing that as an employer. What is your actual employer brand? Uh, it's very important. What is the reputation you have for people wanting to work for you? People have worked for you. Um, your current employees are essentially your, your ambassadors when it comes to this. So having... Uh, companies like ours who can help establish your employer brand and help market your, your company and what it is like to work for your company or doing that on your own um, is very, very important. You know, a lot of people these days, if you reach out to them with a potential job for your company, they're going online, they Google your name right away and they see what the reviews are in different places. So making sure that those reviews are strong, making sure that you have a good culture, a good place to work, and your current employees are the center of all of that. How they feel about these days, there, you know, there's many opportunities for them to write a review and, and tell how they feel. And that's what people who are coming to work for you are going to consider when they are considering working for you. Talents in demand, especially in skilled markets and skilled labor. So the demand is out there. And, and if you're going to score the best candidates, you got to have a very strong employer brand, good place to work. You know, some of the benefits of employer branding, um, your pipeline will be full because people will have word of mouth. Word of mouth marketing is so important. Uh, your time to fill will be quicker because people see, wow, this is an awesome place to work. I'm going to go work there. I really want to be there. And they jump at the opportunity if they hear that you're hiring. And that cu cuts costs, as we mentioned earlier, and it creates quality and engaged employees, which, which, which is what you want. The real key to that, too, is, is developing the compelling reasons why someone would want to work for your company. So this is a, an important exercise for every company. We, we encourage this and every, every client we talk to, a potential client we talk to, go through these seven reasons why uh, an employee would want to work for your company, whether it's you're, in, you're disrupting an industry, there's a real purpose to the work that you're doing, the culture is great, the growth opportunity is amazing, you will have a voice, which is very important for younger generation to have a voice in the place that they work. There's a clear path for career advancement and work-life integration is great. And it's not just work-life balance anymore, it's work-life integration. How can you do what you need to do on a daily basis, both in your personal and professional life? That's a lot of the, the reasons why to outsource on the staffing side. I wanted to go through a couple other brands that we have very quickly here to, to talk about and work that we do at, through Aleron. And the first is with a company that I particularly oversee called Viaduct. And Viaduct was built to help startups and emerging businesses with their similar needs on the talent acquisition side and, and labor and staffing side that I mentioned earlier with Acara. But we do that specifically for startups and specifically for emerging businesses. So as companies are getting into that seed round, they have a great idea. Um, they, their idea is coming to fruition a bit. They've created an MVP um, and they want to grow. That's when Vida can step in and very specific and focused around those companies. So it's a, we do things like aptitude tests for working for a startup and why a 
an employee is a good fit for a startup. Uh, we have people who are experts in that and know that uh, and can help companies and founders of companies um, establish that. The other company I wanted to mention from an outsourcing perspective is our IT outsourcing company. So we have a, a very strong IT group uh, within our, our organization called Loom, which handles, Loom is considered a managed service provider. So we manage uh, IT services at client sites or at, you know, even clients who work remotely. So we'll manage their, their entire machine. We, we monitor things remotely. Um, and the value of that is we create a secure environment. You know, we are experts at creating that. Um, we can control costs for your IT infrastructure, which could get out of control. Uh, you have that third party monitoring and outsourcing. You don't necessarily just have an IT person. You have a vast uh, group of resources to manage your overall IT environment, which is an important part of, of outsourcing your IT. So some of the things going back, just to summarize in the last two slides here, where we start, you know, when we outsource, and, and this is, again, companies like ours do the same thing. We help create profile positions. We help you find fit. We help you know what the fit is. We create your compelling reasons. We really develop your sales pitch. So recruiting is sales. When you're trying to recruit somebody to come work for your company, you're trying to sell them on your company. So we work closely with you to develop that, that quote unquote sales pitch. And just a list of our summary of services on the last slide here for me, um, where we help define roles, where we evaluate criteria, we do assessments, we coach people, um, we provide courses. So we do a lot more in education than just um, staffing and, you know, and, create and finding people. We help educate business leaders and founders and owners in what they need from a staff perspective and, and where to find the best fit. Thank you very much. Thanks, Pete. That, that was a great overview and you know, really what companies need to think about when they're doing hiring and all those critical decisions along the way. So to keep things moving forward so we stay within our hour, I will hand things over to Dan to talk on the accounting side of things. Okay, thank you, Carolyn, <clears throat> and thank you, Pete, for those remarks. Um, you know, a lot of really valuable services that you guys are providing, especially to people looking to expand on both into Canada and into the, the United States. Thank you for that. You know, when we talk about it, it, expanding, you know, one of the areas you didn't talk about was finding accounting talent, right? And it's no secret that finding accounting talent is difficult, and you know, attracting and retaining that talent uh, is also very difficult. As a business owner or operator, you also kind of have to think about you know, training, vacation, unplanned leave, and then all the kind of difficulties on the cross-border side that uh, David spoke about earlier as far as tax considerations. When we think about how traditional accounting departments have been set up in the past, it's really been about task-based organization, not skill-based. When we think about internal controls and segregation of duties, uh, that's oftentimes leading you to pay for excess capacity and you're paying at the maximum skill level required, often having people do tasks that are below their, their actual skill level because you need to kind of pay for that ceiling, not the floor. The accounting world's thinking about controllership a little bit different. One of the leaders in that area is kind of the Deloitte Center for Controllership and they're really trying to push corporate accounting and business accounting to a skill-based model. It's no secret we live in an SME world. As David just talked about earlier, you need him for all that cross-border tax help. You know, that's not something I can do and it's probably not something you could do either. Because of this subject matter-based uh, world that we're all living in now, that's gonna lead many people to kind of look to outsource in their accounting and finance function and move towards more of an accounting as a service or finance as a service model. People often question the feasibility of outsourcing their accounting function, but this has existed for almost every business for a number of years. Businesses have for long periods been comfortable outsourcing things like accounting, HR, recruiting as Pete just mentioned, IT, marketing, and even the manufacturing of their own products. But when somebody suggests outsourcing their accounting, they get you know, a little shaky about it. But in reality, very similar to legal services, you've been outsourcing a lot of your income tax work for long periods of time without ever really thinking about it. As David talked about earlier, 
if, as, if you move down into the United States, you are effectively working with 51 different jurisdic jurisdictions. And to further complicate that matter, if you're coming down from Ontario into the Western New York region, we got different sales tax rates for Niagara County and Erie County. And that's why you might want to consider finding a sales tax team like we have here at Tronconi Segura Associates to kind of outsource a lot of that compliance work. Because just truthfully, you probably don't have the in-house technical capabilities even at home in Canada, and you're unlikely to have that in the United States. Technical accounting services and internal accounting services are also very popular uh, and, and traditional areas of outsourcing that people haven't really thought about in the past, as well as many people now are outsourcing their controller and CFO services. Why is that? Well, they're looking for high level advisors when they need them. And, you know, you might have a bookkeeper, small accounting staff, maybe a few clerks, but you really need that high level accounting person on and finance person on demand. And that's really what we're starting to offer and how we were looking at the evolution of accounting and finance roles. So what about the total package? Well, that's where we have single source accounting. Single source accounting is a full, full service outsourced corporate accounting and finance company focused on growing and transforming businesses on an as needed basis. How can we do that? Well, we're leveraging accounting as a service and finance as a the service model. Using cloud-based technology, a team of finance and accounting specialists to provide previously unattainable tech, uh, technology and expertise for this in the small and medium-sized business space. To do that, you know, we, we leverage uh, a core platform. And if you look on the screen, you know, obviously QuickBooks is very popular, but you know, Veeam, Receipt Bank, those are two actually Canadian companies that we leverage as part of our core stack, uh, tech stack. By using this cloud-based technology, you're kind of able to create a model that you can use on both sides of the border where your accountant, accounting team and your finance team can always be remote, whether in the US or in Canada. And we can completely customize your services to, to your business's needs. We do that through kind of a fixed fee approach that helps control costs. The best part about working with single source is that it's fully customizable to your business individual needs. So you're only really getting the services that you want. It can scale and grow with your business as your business changes. And so if you're working with someone like Pete and Viaduct, you have a high growth business, this is something that can also grow along with you. And if we kind of look at our service levels, it kind of goes everything from a concierge approach, which is essentially just getting our, our tech stack for your team, all the way up to Platinum, which is essentially from end to end, full service, including a CFO on a fixed fee. And what's nice is you're never locked into any of this. And you know, I know we're running short on time, but we just had a client this week that had an unfortunate medical event with one of their staff members that was handling the accounting. Because they were already on our platform, the, the team here at Single Source and Tronconi Segura was able to be out there the next day, make sure everything was set and have been operating their accounting function without any interruption. And so that's really one of the, the big benefits to outsourcing and single source as we, as we look to the future. Um, I know we are short on time, so I'll wrap up my remarks there and pass it back to Carolyn. Thank you, Dan. Um, I appreciate, you know, you going through that quickly. There's so much good information though. Um, hopefully everybody was able to get that. I want to thank all of our panelists today and thank you for your expertise on your subjects and advising companies. It was very informative and gave everybody something to think about as they look to grow their operations in the U.S. You really broke it down into easy things to consider and plan for. As David mentioned, I wanted to remind everyone we do have our next webinar on Thursday, February 11th at noon. Our topic will be doing business in the U.S., sales tax update and state mandates. If you're selling your product or services in many different U.S. states, you will want to join us for all the state updates and to ensure you're compliant as many states are pursuing companies that are over their state thresholds. So if you're not even sure what the thresholds are, you'll definitely wanna join 
um, but then to double check and make sure everything is good, join us on the 11th. Thank you again for joining us on this topic. Um, I don't want to go over the hour and respect, and I definitely want to respect your time. So I want to make sure you have all the contact information for our speakers today. Um, for the Canadian Consulate, I do have Linda up here for her contact information if you have questions for her, and then for David, Peter, and Dan. You can always find any of us and our companies on LinkedIn and other social media pages or check out our website and would like to thank everyone again for joining us today and we'll see you